preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, you know, of course, that our lecture seminars start on February 19th, which is practically around the corner. You'll receive a notice about these very shortly, uh, and the notice includes a subscription blank. We save a few places for members of the 100 Club. So may I suggest that if you're interested, and we hope you are, that you send this uh, subscription blank back as soon as possible. You may recall that Vice President Agnew spoke about TV and the newspapers just before our lecture on communications. Well, things seem to be prearranged for this group, because what a week this has been for Israel. And what a day this is for us, in a way, because we're very lucky to have our speaker this morning. Mr. Lipsky lectures widely across the country, and in fact, in Europe, and I might add Asia. Um, he is a distinguished novelist a lawyer, and a leader among Jewish people in this country, and an expert on Jewish affairs. He's chairman of the board of directors of the Jewish Telegraphic Agency and vice president of the American Jewish League for Israel. May I present Mr. Eliezer Lipsky. Ladies and uh, the gentlemen, um, I'm <clears throat> I understand the proposal is to speak for 40 minutes and then invite questions. And I will be happier when the questions come, because then I can uh, address myself to things that are on your mind, as well as things that I think are, uh, are uh, that are on mine. Well, I think this will be loud enough. And if not, my voice goes up as I get passionate and excited. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the great uh, day, I suppose, for Israel that makes me sympathetic is the fact that, uh, as was said in, uh, by uh, General Chaim Herzog, who is the chief of intelligence uh, operations in Israel, is <clears throat> that Israel has been redressing the balance of trade by importing gunboats and uh, exporting ideas for thrillers. <laughs> and since I've written some thrillers in my time, I'm very sympathetic to the Sherberg caper <coughs> and the uh, snatch of the radar. And it's just given everything a sort of a lift that we need in these depressing times. And uh, I, I, you can be sure that all over the world, uh, hundreds of writers are sitting down with this idea in mind as to how the People, the umbrellas of Sherberg were out to uh, conceal the operation in which the whole town apparently uh, uh, connived to keep quiet the departure of those boats uh, from uh, Sherberg, indicating, as everyone might have suspected, that the French public, the French people, have quite a different view of the situation in the Middle East than their government has, and that they're quite uh, out of sympathy with the government's policies there. Uh, the, uh, the this is the current this is the current thing, and I would th think that it has had a very real effect upon the international climate. It seems like a trifling thing, but uh, in the situation where everything seemed to be going downhill, in which clouds of gloom were gathering, this incident. I think, has had a very important effect upon the attitudes of people all over the world. That coupled with many other things. I want to go back into the roots of things, but I don't want to get away from the uh, present moment, the current event, uh, which has been governing the mood of uh, the situation in the Middle East. The operation, which was so well and skillfully carried out, showed the intelligence of people in Israel at the best form. 
And it showed a great capacity, I think, of the government and the structure of Israel to be ingenious in uh, very severe circumstances. And it gives us a glimpse into the character of the people who are conducting the war and who are, co are conducting things that are connected with the war. And that is these kind of operations which have to do with the procurement of arms the uh, relationships with governments under adverse circumstances, and uh, enhance the stature and the quality of the people who are entrusted with these affairs. I think that there's been a great deal of comment on the quality of the Israeli operation and the Israeli intelligence people by saying it's one of the best, it is the best in the world. And the reason I think that it can be the best in the world is that since Israel is a very small country with limited opportunities, the PhDs, the people who are, uh, who in this country might be in the universities working in mathematics and sciences and uh, political science and all the things that call for scholarship, in a country like Israel, look primarily to the security of the country and the future, and by addressing themselves to its problems and being entrusted with top positions, I think that the brilliance of the people uh, in Israel is concentrated in the survival of the state, whereas in the United States, the same, the equivalent type of people are diffused into the uh, university structure, diffused into the business structure, and not concentrated in these aspects of naked survival. Nothing is left to other people to do. It is the very best people who are called upon to do these operations. And that, I think, was evident. Maybe not everybody realized, uh, was reasoning it out as I'm now reasoning it out. But I think that this then suddenly gives a great measure of confidence. <clears throat> the other aspect that has been giving a great deal of confidence to people and uh, hope and amusement was that the radar affair was fortuitous, it's true. <clears throat> but it has come in as a climax of the military operations which have been going on for some period of time. Some months ago, uh, I haven't worked out the, I don't recall the exact chronology, but I think it was about three or four months ago, or maybe five months ago, the Israeli Air Force began systematically to, be, to destroy the uh, defenses of Egypt along the west coast of the Suez Canal and down along the Red Sea. There was one occasion when we read that in a very ingenious operation where they were using the Russian equipment that had been captured in 1967, which was surreptitiously brought across the Sinai and surreptitiously landed on the Egyptian side of the Red Sea, uh, Israeli soldiers looking like Arabs, talking Arabs, and wearing a special uniform designed for the occasion to look roughly like Egyptian uniforms landed on the Egyptian coast and went down for a distance of 50 miles, destroying all the establishments along the way, and then retreated. It was reminiscent of the Elan and the Dash, which the Israelis used during the Six-Day War itself, and was Israel as she had been in 1967. Now, from that point in which the radar establishments were destroyed, there have been daily attacks by the Air Force itself along the line of the Egyptian defenses. Apparently, uh, what has been going on, uh, from what I can judge, is that in 1967, Israel had the advantage of great surprise because the radar then used was high-level radar, and they were able to come under the radar. Now the Russians at the Egyptian urging have supplied another kind of radar which uh, detects low-flying objects. And uh, these low-flying objects would prevent similar surprise taking place. And it was the Israel's objective to destroy that warning system and to leave the Egyptians uh, naked to a, another surprise attack. That had been going on systematically every single day. And every day that you pick up the Times, you see that Israel has attacked posi Egyptian positions. And the surprising thing has been that with all the equipment which the Russians have been giving to the Egyptians, and with the word that uh, Russians have themselves been flying this equipment on the Egyptian side of the canal, 
that there has been no opposition of any significance. Every once in a while, as though for the record, the Egyptians are sending airplanes in to attack the desert and to drop a bomb someplace where it's safe enough and they go in and get out maybe in two, three minutes before anything can happen. But nevertheless, in the period of time, according to the Israeli sources, uh, 78 uh, Egyptian aircraft have been destroyed either by ground fire or by um, combat in the air. But the fact that has now been revealed is that the Egyptian coast apparently has been completely demolished. It uh, will be resupplied, I don't doubt, by the Russians. But for the moment, the effectiveness of the Israeli Air Force and the ground forces and the reinforcement has been such that Israel has demonstrated to the world and to Egypt herself that at this point, Egypt cannot hope to mount an attack against Israel and cannot hope to cross the Suez Canal or the Red Sea because of the presence of the Israeli Air Force. Now that, I think, has a very important uh, consideration because it means that time is being bought and that it puts off at least for a year the possibility of any renewal of the war by the Egyptians, if ever, because as the Egyptians may try to recover from these losses, to the general disgust that the Russians must be feeling for them to find that the best equipment that they're giving is, gets over to Israel and the American experts come and view their electronic uh, developments, it must very seriously qualify the Egyptian position, which is why I feel that although it looks trivial and is a matter of laughter and everybody is amused and everybody thinks it's a great joke, and it is a great joke. After all, we live in the political military world where these kind of amusing episodes don't always happen. But the fact that a joke can take place, the release of laughter, which is so important in the theater, is also terribly important in real life where we all seem to be theatrical per personalities living as extras in a big drama, the plot of which we know nothing about. This has got to have a very important effect because it definitely shows that in spite of all the gloom and the foreboding that the small group of people living in Israel have the qualities which they displayed on the last occasion, that there's been no diminution of the different uh, human aspects of the situation. And it is in the human aspects that Israel's security rests and that uh, Egypt falls into disarray. The other thing that happened during this recent period of time, which is, I think, momentous and revealing and encouraging, is this. In the great propaganda war that is going on, uh, the third world forces, the new left forces, the babble of voices that assail Israel, the new anti-Zionism uh, that is taking place all over the world, the berating of Israel, the law, alleged loss of Israel's image, which has been a serious propaganda loss. The erosion of Israel's image, I don't think, is the fault of Israel. I think it is simply the superior number of voices, the superior number of outlets that the enemy has. The anti-Israel propaganda begins with its greatest, most stentorian tones in Russia herself, with all the vast propaganda machine that she has inside Russia and inside all the Iron Curtain countries that she dominates, who follow slavishly uh, in the foreign policy that Russia lays down. And then that penetrates into the controlled creatures that they have all over the world, the communist parties and people who are paid and the affiliates who hang on, and then the emotionally enslaved people who respond to these signals and to these messages that come from that area. I'm only concerned now on the Israel aspect. They have apparently got in the third world people, unjustifiably, and I think uh, uh, tragically from every point of view, large numbers of Asian countries and African countries, which should know better and probably do know better, have found it convenient for many reasons to join the Afro, uh, the Arab bloc of 13 countries, the Russian bloc of countries, the uh, New World bloc of countries like Egypt, Egypt and uh, Pakistan, people like that. All these people have been assailing Israel and have their echoes in this country. And anybody who follows the newspapers and sees what goes on in universities knows 
that in this country the voices of people, including young Jews, who ought to know better, and maybe older Jews who ought to know better, are all going around tarnishing Israel's image, and Israel's had that of, has been suffering as a result of that. Uh, we have to be realistic about this thing and see that in a very short space of time, Israel, which was the darling of the world in June of 1967, suddenly has become a terrible and imperialist colonial power, brutally dealing with people and all the rest of this, these falsehoods. And suddenly, <coughs> The other event that took place that sort of blew this apart was the conference at Rabat where the Arab countries came together to plan a summit conference to deal with Israel. And there was great foreboding about that summit conference that Israel would then find themselves faced with the uh, united Arab forces with their 80 million people and the tremendous uh, number of people that they have. And lo and behold, as better sense might have indicated. When they came together, it was an Israeli victory. It was a Western victory. It was a victory for common sense. Because when they came together, they began to see that this uh, foolish myth of a united Arab people fell apart instantly. They're not all Arabs. They all talk Arabic, of course, but that's as much to say that a British West Indian of black color is an Englishman because he talks English. He's, uh, he's talking English, but he's not an Englishman. Or Canadians are not Americans. Uh, every, everybody talks English, but that doesn't mean that this fact that we all speak English gives us any great political unity. And so in the Arab world, and I don't want to go into all of that, but <clears throat> anyone who will study Arab, the Arab world or read any superficial book about it will realize that although Arabic is the language of many, many, many countries and Islam the religion of many, many countries, when it comes to politics and war and national interests, they are as diverse among themselves as Europeans are. And uh, the unity of Europe, uh, as between Poland, let us say, and uh, England, is just about the same kind of unity that you find between Morocco, with its monarchy sitting on a shaky throne, and, uh, Ibn S and Faisal of Saudi Arabia sitting on his very shaky throne, and the Sheikh of uh, Kuwait, who trembles when the Nasserites come to take away his oil from him, and all these complicated things, they all came together, <clears throat> and you found that the very first word out of the box was that they had more hostility among themselves and more mutual fear of each other than any single one of them has of Israel. Now, this is all hidden because the, the, the headlines disguise all this. But just think for a moment. Uh, when I was last talking here about a year ago, I went into some depth into the problems of this area. But for since 1962, Nasser, using Egyptian equipment, which by this time is about $5 billion worth of equipment, enormous amounts of money have been poured by Russia into the arming of Egypt, used it first not against Israel, which is a bystander in the thing, but used it first to foment a national uprising in the Yemen, which was then under uh, the old Iman had died, and the successor had just gotten into office when the Russians staged a war of national uh, liberation in Egypt, using the, in the Yemen, using the Egyptians as a stalking horse. Egyptian soldiers, 50,000 Egyptian soldiers, were sent down there to help a national uprising in this other country. Uh, maybe at that time there were more Egyptian soldiers in the Yemen fighting for the national uprising that was supposed to take place there than at that time there were Americans in Vietnam. And they were all brought there, and this is all, by the way, if you recall in the, in the daily newspapers, because no secret of it, they were all brought there in Russian transports to carry on this war of national liberation that was spontaneously emerging in the Yemen. And the people who were engaged in this war of national liberation there were creatures who had first come there and gotten their paychecks in Egypt and then went down there to be Yemenite patriots. Uh, within a few months, I mean, eight weeks of before this uh, war of national liberation had really succeeded, it was just beginning, the State Department hastened to recognize the new government 
But lo and behold, the old government had not gone out of existence. The monarchy in uh, the Yemen was still functioning. The tribes had taken back to the hills. The cruelties perpetrated by the Egyptians, who were bombing villages with napalm and dropping poison gas and killing women and children in atrocities that never seem to be atrocities when they're taking place in these backward countries, as far as the press is concerned. These tribes, outraged by the atrocities, had taken to the hills and were bitterly resisting the war that was supposed to liberate them. On the top of all this, and the significance it has for Rabat was that the monarchy in the Yemen was being supported by King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, who had come to the United States alarmed at the use that the Egyptians were making of Russian weapons in the country adjacent to his, expecting, as later happened, the Egyptians to come out of Aden, as they did, so that Aden was now taken over by these same forces. And he got from the United States $400 million worth of planes, together with the British who pitched into this battle to defend those oil fields. And those planes were being used by King Faisal, flown by British pilots, to resist the war of national liberation, which NASA was imposing upon the Yemen. Now, as soon as you observe these things taking place, you realize that the real target of this operation couldn't be the Yemen, which itself is just a desert, which people earn a bare living in a nomadic existence and a primitive agriculture and about nothing else. The real purpose of this attack upon the Yemen was to bring it to the next country in line for a war of national liberation, and that's Saudi Arabia, with its reputed 150 billion gallons of oil sitting there, a trillion, whatever the number is, of gallons of oil that are down there in the sands, in which America has an interest. So that if anyone is to be alarmed by the rise of Nasser, it is surely not Israel, which has defeated him three times. It's got to be King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Now, up until this point, Faisal and the Sheikh in Kuwait, who has a, the identical problem, and for that matter, the Sheikhs who have now formed a confederation on the, Iran, uh, the Persian Gulf and uh, who want the oil for their own benefit and their own people and their own development, all of these people on the periphery of Arabia, uh, of the, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, are all watching the rise of a Russian-mounted offensive to take over what it is that they've got, the wealth of oil. And all this is that they are, they are in the path of harm. So when we come to Rabat, the situation was that following 1967, in order to buy his peace and safety, and to ensure that the Nasser would not foment, uh, through his agents, an uprising within his own domain. And they are regularly discovering plots to this effect. Faisal and, uh, for Saudi Arabia and Kuwait had together provided Egypt with about $250 million to $300 million a year to offset the loss of revenue to Egypt from the closing of the Suez Canal. Now, of course, the closing of the Suez Canal, which lost them this money um, from the fees of going through transit, did not offset the loss of the tourist trade, does not offset the fact that the population continues to rise, does not offset the disasters of the Aswan Dam, which far from helping Egypt have hurt her ecologically in many, many curious ways by preventing the silt, the annual silt from coming down the Nile, by pushing back the uh, Mediterranean, by spoiling the fisheries in the, in the Delta, by the spread of disease in the canals, by many, many different ways. This Aswan Dam has been an economic disaster for the Egyptians. All of this thing has left Egypt more and more and more impoverished with whatever she's got going into carrying on a fruitless and hopeless and foolish war against Israel to the detriment of the population. So that the $300 million is surely not enough. 
And the very first demand that was made at Rabat was a demand for more money from Saudi Arabia and Kuwait for more arms to be obtained. Now, much as the wealth seems to be in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, no matter how much they're getting, billion dollars, two billion dollars, as development budgets go, when you're trying to take a country that's in the desert and doing everything, putting down roads, building universities, educating people, starting factories, doing everything to modernize a country, it's very little money indeed. And according to the reports, the Nasser, who had previously had a, a uh, conference with Faisal in Cairo, and apparently they had ostensibly hugged each other, kissed each other, done all the things that Egyptians do to each other when they meet in public, and seem to enjoy, strangely enough. <laughs> uh, in spite of all these preliminary uh, talks about harmony, Nasser, in his typical a way, confronted Faisal with a public demand for what I think was $80 million more than he had been getting. Whereupon Faisal, who says he has nothing personal against Nasser and that this is all merely statesmanship, got up and asked him to account for what he did with the money he already had. And whereupon they got a furious with each other, no doubt they stamped their feet and they probably rose to a high falsetto of, ex of vituperation with each other and the whole meeting collapsed because it was immediately apparent that there is no unity of interest among these people, that they may all be Arabs and they may all be professing to hate Israel and they probably do in their way hate Israel, but behind all this there's not so much hatred after all. The uh, reports that one gets, there's a very illuminating article that a magazine, Midstream, uh, put out by uh, the Herzl Foundation, which reprints it from Encounter, the uh, liberal magazine in London. Uh, I forget the, the, the Arabic name of the writer, but it was a very illuminating article of a trip into Egypt, where this man, who is himself an Egyptian living in London, had reported on the uh, attitude of Egypt. So he said, yes, they're anti-Israel, but they're anti-Israel in the way that uh, any people in any country is theoretically against some other country. They are fed up. Fed up by the war, fed up by the poverty, fed up by the confusion, fed up by the lowering of the standard of living, fed up by the hopelessness of life in this country, which cannot organize itself to give people some better life fed up by the constant defeats, fed up by the terror, fed up by the fear of more wars with Israel, fed up with their fear of Israel, and apathetic and just hoping that there could be some solution, as we might suspect, as we might suspect if we were not listening to the statements that come out of the government about the rage that the people have, their pride, their bitterness, their hatred of Israel. In other words, a war-weary people who are looking for peace, and a tottering regime which is kept in power only by the force of arms and by the Russian support. Every indication in the, we have is that it's a most unpopular government, that the war policies are unpopular, that people cannot talk because of the, the police, the censorship, and everything else, and that this is the true, the true feeling among the Arabs. I think it must be true if I can put in one little personal experience I had at, a, uh, at an institute I attended down in, in uh, North Carolina where I met uh, some Arabs who were in, a, in this institute. One fellow who was a Syrian, uh, an employee of the World Bank here, who had a talk with me which I could almost say would be as though I, if I didn't know he was a Syrian I would have thought he was a Jew because his attitude toward the situation was pretty much what I would expect the Israeli attitude to be. Now, this is not Egypt, this is Syria. And Syria is supposed to be the most intransigent of all countries. And this fellow was telling me that when he goes back to Syria and talks to his brothers and his father, they say they are in despair with the government, that they fear war with Israel. After all, Damascus is only, I think, 20 miles away or 30 miles, or some short distance away from the battlefront. And they know that the Syrian army cannot resist the Israeli army. And they have seen the effects of this disaster. And what this fellow was saying to me is that the common talk in his family is, if only they could stop spending money on arms which they buy from Russia. 
He says, after all, we do pay for those arms, and it impoverishes the country. If only we could put this money for building up the uh, well-being of the people, use it to social purposes. If only we could get rid of this government. And he said, by way of his solution, if only Israel would do something about the Golan Heights. He didn't say give it back. He said do something about the Golan Heights and do something about the refugees. Then we could make peace. He said, by the way, he told me too that the most admired man in Israel is Diane. He said, that's the kind of a fellow that the Arabs admire. And you can understand why. He has all the qualities which the Arabs traditionally admire. And he represents a man who talks straight to them, who is a good soldier, who's not vindictive, who, who, who yeah, I mean, I mean, he's an exemplary man from their point, from the Arab point of view. Well, I'm only giving this to you as a taste of what I think must be the prevailing truth, that the mob is one thing, that the regime is another thing, and that the ordinary man in the street, the ordinary fellow who's living at home in a family life who has warm feelings and who is an oriental and whose temperament is Jewish, after all these things, the cultural uh, inertia, the personalities of people don't change over the centuries. I think, essentially speaking, that if you meet Arabs, they're very much like Jews, and Jews are very much like Arabs, because we all come from the same part of the world. So if we could imagine that uh, behind the facade, there are people very much like ourselves, and if we use our imaginations a little bit and say, what are they probably for? They are probably for peace. Who can deny it? They are probably for an end of the agitation. They are probably for ed more education. They're probably for a little car and a television set and a better home. You know, the things that everybody's for, that we're for. And this goes on behind. So therefore, I cannot believe that behind all the activity of these uh, brutal, repressive regimes, there are not the viewpoint of the people themselves. And this, I think, came out at Rabat, because they just fell into disarray in their mutual quarrels. And the, the recriminations among even the intransigent regimes, the left wing regimes, the Ba'athists in Syria and those in Iraq are murderously in hatred of each other because they're rivals for supremacy in the same party. It is my belief that they hate each other more than they hate Israel because they are contending rivals like mafiosi for the leadership of whatever it is that they're doing. And they are rivals with Nasser for the leadership within the Arab world. The Algerians certainly must be rivals in contending with Nasser to be the most extreme left. And so they vie with each other, they contend with each other, they are rivals to each other, and although they would love to have unity as against Israel, unity cannot be achieved unless somebody agrees to merge with somebody else and stop being the head of state of his particular state or his particular fiefdom. And they're like a bunch of feudal lords be in the time of the Norman conquest in England fiercely contending, fighting among themselves, and only coming together for this ostensible fight against Israel. So I think that the Rabat business blew aside the myth that these people are really all against Israel. And in fact, they are, if not, I, I, I can't say that I have proof of this, but I haven't got the slightest doubt that among themselves, whenever Nasser takes a fall, Whenever he is subject to a humiliation, you can be sure it's just part of human nature that every other Arab feels good. It's got to be. <laughs> if I have a joke, I had one story that I did hear, and it was told to me by a reliable source, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency reporter in uh, London, Sam Goldsmith, who said that in the Dorchester, uh, Hussein's brother, the regular uh, guest, and he regularly has a haircut down in the barber shop. And the barber there is a Jew, and they have been friends over many years. <laughs> and the day that Bobby Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Hussein's brother came down for his regular haircut, livid with rage about this uh, Sirhan. He said, and he used an opprobrious term. I think it was a seven-letter word, a five-letter word. He said, if he really wanted to help the Arab people, why didn't he kill Nasser? <laughs> this, this feeling of bitterness against Nasser is felt by Hussein among all people because Hussein was marked for assassination. If there have ever been a plot within Jordan against the life of Hussein as there was against his father Abdullah who in fact was assassinated, 
These plots come out of either of Syria or they come out of Egypt. And this is the balancing act that Hussein has to do to keep himself on the throne while being against Israel and trying his very best to find some way to work out a deal with Israel so that he can stay on the throne of Jordan and continue as, as the king. Now this is all part of the background against which we have this remarkable exhibition that I suppose is in the forefront of all our minds, and that is this, the antics of the State Department caper. Uh, that is Secretary of State Rogers uh, statement as to the position paper taken by the United States government with respect to the four power talks. Now, I think last time when I had been here to discussing the attitude of the United States, I was then, had just come from a uh, meeting which had been held by the America-Israel Policy Action Committee in Washington at which resolutions were adopted, endorsed by substantial numbers of uh, congressmen and senators uh, memorializing the United States uh, government and the State Department that it was the sense of the Congress to oppose any attempts by four power talks or otherwise to impose a settlement on the Middle East. Now at that time, uh, we have uh, uh, an unofficial lobby in Washington in this committee. Uh, it's headed up by a very skilled lobbyist and newspaper man, Cy Cannon, who for many years has been in Washington and who formerly represented different uh, Zionist organizations, but it's now an independent committee, independently financed, and it's not tax deductible, so people who support it get no such benefits. Now at that time, uh, Kennan and Irving Kane of uh, Cleveland had been in to see the government. And although they're an unofficial body, the fact is that almost everybody who supports that organization is an officer of major Jewish organizations, so it has a great deal of status. And the re unofficial reports were that the Nixon administration had put in charge of the Near East desk uh, Cisco, Joseph, Joseph Cisco of Chicago, his fellow uh, Italian-American, uh, who was a most brilliant man. And the unofficial statements had been that it was Nixon's point of view and Cisco had been assigned to carry out the policy in such a form as to leave Israel assured of the support of the United States government. And there were some anecdotes, unofficial anecdotes, to support that to the effect that uh, on one occasion when after a conference uh, it was reported back to Cisco that uh, Kane and Cannon had been unhappy at something that they had heard, he called up to say, now you fellows ought to know that uh, if you have any uh, real feelings of unhappiness here, the phone is there, pick it up, call me, tell me about it. I don't want to hear indirectly from some third party that you're not satisfied with what we're doing because I want to assure you that the United States government is completely behind Israel. We support Israel and we will not do anything that would <coughs> jeopardize the security of Israel. The reason I feel at liberty to say this unofficially is because Cisco came to the uh, conference and for about two hours, uh, was delivering the viewpoint of the American government a short time ago, a year ago. And he said in public what had been said unofficially, since people are likely to tell the truth unofficially and to gloss it over publicly, I give the anecdote, anecdote to say it was not only something he was telling a group of people publicly, it was something that he was talking about informally to people that he was trying to cultivate for friendship. And at that time, questions were being put by... Uh, personalities from all over the country. And I may say, by the way, it was just really a great feeling of satisfaction to find so many people from so many parts of the country who were active in support of Israel and so many different organizations in a wide spectrum of, or of Jewish organizations. And the intelligence and the sophistication and the knowledge uh, showed that this body of people who had gathered were people who understood what they were talking about, who were a moderate in their point of view, very anxious and very concerned and very informed. And Cisco was a delight to listen to. 
because uh, aside from the personal brilliance that he displayed, he knew every nuance of the business. Not only the State Department's share of the business and the formal government side of the thing, but he knew what the Zionist structure was all about. He knew what the people were talking about. He knows the personalities within the Zionist movement. He knows every one of the government officials in Israel, and he knew who all, uh, all the people were that he was addressing, and he was addressing himself with a great deal of vigor and forthright, uh, uh, in the most forthright way there. And one could only go away and say, as I then reported, I think, to this body <laughs> in 92nd Street, that as far as I was able to determine, the position of the United States government was exemplary on paper. I couldn't have asked for anything more. Couldn't have written a better position for the United States than the position that the United States was taking as the great friend of Israel. The only thing that I held out as a reservation, the thing that I held out mainly, however, as a reservation was this. It was still lingering in my mind the fact that in the Six-Day War, President Johnson had announced on television, because it was necessary for him to announce, that the United States government in that war had no commitment to, no treaty commitment, that's how he phrased it, no treaty commitment to Israel. And the fact was that the statement to Israel by the United States government people was, boys, you're on your own, quote, unquote. That was the words used. Well, you're on your own. Israel is going to have to depend upon itself to fight the war. Of course, there was the comfort that the CIA had evaluated the Israel military in such form as to predict that Israel would win. And therefore, it was a comfortable and possible position for the United States to take, uh, not fearing the outcome. But nevertheless, before the, balance, before the war was fought, this was the position of the government then under Johnson. And that was a position that he had inherited from President Eisenhower. And now President Nixon, of course, was the vice president at that time. That the United States then had no treaty commitment to Israel. And in spite of all the talk about the fact that the United States supports Israel and has moral responsibilities and everything else, to this date, there is no treaty commitment to Israel. This was the flaw, a fly in the ointment. There was no mutual security pact, nothing like the deal with Taiwan, nothing like our arrangements with NATO countries, nothing like our arrangements with Australia and New Zealand, nothing like our arrangements with Germany. Israel is there with moral support, economic support, military support, but not any military commitment by the United States to do anything for Israel. So Israel is on her own. Now, since that period of time, there has come this new paper by Rogers. I'm coming to the end of my time, so I cannot go into the details, though I'll uh, talk about it if questions are asked. No, well, I mean, the details most everybody knows that, uh, and so I'll just say this in a general kind of way. As I read uh, the paper, the, the, first, the first position taken by the United States, broadly speaking, was that the United States accepted the position that Israel had taken, that the only way peace can be worked out in the Middle East is by negotiations between the parties, uh, but uh, you know, a reduced to a treaty which commits the people to peace and a whole variety of uh, things that flow from that. With the exception of Jerusalem and the Golan Heights, maybe even the Gaza Strip, Israel has stated that there are no preconditions, that everything is open for discussion. When chided that, uh, how can you say that when you say in advance that uh, Jerusalem will not be uh, surrendered back to Jordan and the Golan Heights will be <laughs> occupied, and say, that's our position. That's our position. But that doesn't mean we won't talk about it. In other words, it's setting up a tough bargaining position and saying, we'll talk about anything. We're just telling you what we're going to demand. Uh, that had been the Israeli basic position. That was what the meeting was about a year ago at which Cisco was talking, that the peace must be negotiated between Israel and the Arab countries in direct negotiations. <coughs> and that was then supported by the United States. The basic thing that Rogers did was that while talking about this over the years, the thing that I, 
I, mean, I say I then feared. I mean, I, I pointed this out, but I think it was in everybody's mind that even though the United States said a year ago that it would support Israel completely in this position and meant it, and I believe that the United States meant it, I said the United States can't mean it the way Israel means it because to Israel, Israel's life is affected, whereas the United States, his life is not affected and it is merely an advocate for a client and there comes a point when the advocate gives up and says, I can't do any better, I'd better fall back to another position and then the advocate works on the client to assure the client that that's a deal that's satisfactory and no matter how unhappy the client gets, it's the advocate who is now working on his own client to take a deal and that this would happen. And so it did happen because as the United States kept supporting Israel, the great propaganda war that I'm talking about, the erosion of Israel's image and all this thing was going on, and the Russians, who at first were inclined to make some concessions to the demands of the United States, and every once in a while we could get to hear that they were saying, yes, this, yes, that, yes, it should be a package deal, yes, Israel shouldn't move until it's all agreed to, all these things which seemed to be yielding on the part of the Russians, the Russians came back and said that they couldn't make the Arabs go along with it, and the Russians were pulling back from their position and getting more harder and harder. And now the United States comes along and adopts, in effect, the Russian position. That first, the big powers will negotiate among themselves. The old formula was that the United States would not negotiate away anything that was important to Israel. But nevertheless, they will negotiate among themselves, and when the big powers have arrived at what they think is a fair and equitable solution, they will say, now you've got to take it and present it to both sides uh, aggressively, demanding that both sides take it. Well, the United States has fallen away from that position and brought out this program. Now, on reading the program and reading the statement by Rogers, my own uninstructed view as I read this thing was, that the United States had written a very skillful legal document which did not give away Israel's position seriously. And where it seemed to be giving away Israel's position, it really was not giving away the position beyond what it was manifest on the surface. Let me give one illustration before I come to my, uh, my comment on it. When uh, the United States says it believes that Israel must withdraw from the Sinai, and then make some security arrangements and negotiate those security arrangements with Egypt. Everybody was alarmed and <coughs> say, how can the United States say this? That's betraying Israel. That is demanding Israel pull back. And uh, all sorts of uh, things are said by way of betrayal. From Cairo, instead of 10 minutes away from uh, Tel Aviv, and Israel should be saying, we won't sit down with the Egyptians. Let them come to us. So as soon as... Uh, uh, Mrs. Meir or Abba Iban say to the world, we will sit down with the Egyptians. It is a foregone conclusion, and they know it in Israel, and they know it in Egypt, and everybody who reads the paper knows that Israel is saying, louder than words, we will pull out of the Sinai. The only thing is, to what degree will they pull out of the Sinai? Now, Israel says, rightly so, there must be security arrangements, either to demilitarize the Sinai or something. I think that the building up that's going on of the Sharm el-Sheikh, you saw on television something which uh, we might have suspected, that a road is being put down the uh, east bank of the Sinai Triangle down to the Sharm el-Sheikh, so that it's a drive of four hours for military support. Israel is acting as though she's going to be in the Sharm el-Sheikh, and that's the position, and they're not going to give up the Sharm el-Sheikh. Since the Sharm el-Sheikh means nothing to Egypt, except for the possibility of stopping Israeli shipping going into Eilat, the position of Egypt on Sharm el-Sheikh is in itself a test of their willingness to make peace, because there's absolutely not the slightest reason for them to want to be there. There's nothing there except that it interdicts Israeli shipping. And if Israel says, we want to be there to make sure you don't interdict our shipping, and Egypt says, we want to be there so that we can interdict the shipping, there'll be no peace treaty anyhow, and the thing will continue. So to have Rogers say this obvious thing on paper in itself is, to my mind, no different from what is obvious on the face of it. Now, there are other things which are not so good, and that has to do with the insistence about the Arab refugees, the statements about Jerusalem. But let me, let me the refugee situation is tougher, but let me deal with the, with the Jerusalem business. 
I mean, nobody who comes down to look at Jerusalem with its 200,000 to 250,000 Jews, and there's soon going to be 350,000 Jews there, and see this big, big, what's getting to be a, a big city, and the little old, old city with its maybe 60,000 Arab inhabitants who are split up among Christians and Muslims, and the Jewish quarter which the Jews had occupied with about 20,000 Jews inside the walled area before they were driven out by Jordan, nobody will seriously believe for one moment that Jordan can possibly hope to become governor of 250,000 to 300,000 Jews in this modern city of uh, Jerusalem. So what it really comes down to talking about Jerusalem when you get down to it is really the holy sites, a very small area, uh, an area which is even under Arab conceptions, mixed Jewish and Arab to begin with, and a lot of international uh, interests that are there mostly connected with the holy sites. Now, when it's some, the United States therefore is very careful, and Rogers in his discussion with the agitated presidents of the major Jewish organizations lost his temper at one point, and he said, you fellows are only looking at the side you want to look at, you're not looking at anything else, which we've put in there. He said, nowhere, said Rogers, in the informal discussion, did I any place, or did we any place put down the notion that Jordan is to have any political rights in Jerusalem? The idea isn't to give Jordan, according to the American, American position, any political rights over Jerusalem. The idea isn't to internationalize Jerusalem. The idea is to give Jordan, as he says, and Israel, rights and he doesn't spell out what those rights are in the civic and religious and economic life of the city. Now, when you stop to think about it, this is not such a dreadful or far-fetched thing because Israel has always said that as far as the holy places are concerned, she is perfectly willing to have some international body assume the supervision of those rights. As a matter of fact, right now, the Muslims do supervise the holy places of the Muslims, and the Christian ch and the churches control their own holy places. And in that part of the world, not too long ago, foreign countries did have certain specified rights known as extraterritorial rights. We forget that down to the First World War, the big European powers in China, in the Ottoman Empire, and probably in many other Asiatic countries that I don't know about, customarily had extraterritorial rights within those countries. In Shanghai, there was an international court of justice of which American judges sat. And when an American got into trouble in China, he came before the international court to be judged by an American judge in a dispute that he might have with the Chinese. It was all thoroughly justified at the time because from a commercial point of view and many reasons, the Chinese judicial system was inadequate to deal with the matter, and the European countries, in order to function within China as economic entities, had to provide for special systems of law under which the foreign countries had special rights within China. The same thing was true of the Ottoman Empire. I remember meeting a fellow once who was told me that as a kid, he remembered going to the Austrian post office. And they used to say they went to the Austrian post office because that represented something high and wonderful that the Austrian emperor had his postal system in Jerusalem because the Turks didn't have an adequate postal system. So I presume that the British had a postal system and the French had a postal system. And if you got in trouble in this part of the world, you went to the consul for help. And if you needed uh, to go to a court, it was the British consul who would sit in judgment on disputes. In fact, there's the Jews at that time, since they were stateless refugees from Tsarist Russia, used to come before the British consul under their special letters which were given. It's a whole episode in itself. So suppose in this holy city, some arrangement is made that a Jordanian can live there, and if he gets into trouble with another Jordanian, he can have recourse to a Jordanian court or to an international court or something like that. Nobody likes that. The United States would revolt against it because it would be against our dignity. But if that were the price of peace with Jordan, wouldn't the pragmatic Israelis say, fine, let it be, find all sorts of ways of handling the situation? If it comes to who's supposed to be responsible for the mosque, wouldn't they be better off if Jordan was responsible for the mosque instead of having all the trouble when the lunatic comes along and sets it on fire? I mean, obviously, these, these things are not such 
far-fetched things. And Rogers is a careful lawyer of a big Wall Street firm. And let's not characterize how far you can trust them. Uh, has very carefully not spelled out what he means by this. So the Jews are suspicious. What does he mean? And the Arabs are saying to themselves suspiciously, what does it mean? And they both are everybody suspicious, and rightly so. But all he really means is, I'm trying to get hold of some formula, which if the parties will accept it and work it out among themselves, we will bless it and support it. It's not so bad. There is something, however, that is very bad about the whole business. When I'm saying that on paper it isn't bad, it's because it isn't what's on paper that counts. I mean, if you went through almost everything except the refugee thing, where they're demanding that the refugees have a right to come back and can freely choose. Now, the Israel government has pointed out, and everybody has pointed out, that the really bad thing about it is not that justice must not be done to the refugee. I think this is the fundamental thing in, in Zionist thinking and Israeli thinking and Jewish thinking and the right thinking of everybody, that no matter how it came about and no matter how little they deserve it, in terms of their own past behavior, their own exaltation, and their own intentions. I may say, by the way, I mean by that is this. When those two uh, 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 terrorists in Acre were about to commit some atrocities against the population of Israel by bringing in dynamite to blow up uh, the women and children, presumably at uh, supermarkets and places like that, the reason why the Jewish population was enraged and was ready to attack the Arabs was because they had circulated among the Arabs that the people who were blown up were Jews. And they took to the streets singing and dancing and marching in triumph because some Jews had been blown up by the Arab terrorists. So when it comes to this situation here, the people who are exulting at the idea that some people had been blown up by terrorists don't have to have that kind of sentimental feeling. That has nothing to do with justice. Whatever their feelings, they are certainly entitled to justice. And that is the Jewish position. But what is the justice of this situation that is being called upon? It is being said that they should have a free choice. But you know, as soon as you raise the question of refugees, having a free choice to enter Israel or get compensation, that there will be no free choice. There cannot be a free choice because for 25 years they've had no free choice. They have been herded by their own governments into these refugee camps and have been prevented from getting out of those refugee camps by their own governments. And the reason that they're kept in the refugee camps is because these governments fear them. Up there in Lebanon, I remember talking to a Lebanese girl at this institute I described. She said, there I am, a refugee living up in Lebanon. I said, well, why do you live in the refugee camp? I mean, why don't you just go out and get a job? He says, well, the Lebanese government doesn't allow that. They're not citizens of Lebanon. I said, well, why don't, you, why don't they let you be citizens? She said, well, of course, they have to take care of their own people first. Same thing is true in Syria. They're not fellow Arabs. They take care of their own people first. Well, these are foreign countries. But you take the situation in the West Bank. Go down to Jericho, and you'll see a refugee camp that has been put down in Jericho with something like 20,000, 30,000 people were forced to live by Hussein. Now, these people are living in Palestine. Right down to 1948, Lebanon, uh, Jordan was part of Palestine, administered by a British high commissioner. Never stopped being part of Palestine, even though it had a king under special rule. The West Bank is certainly of Jordan was certainly part of Palestine, annexed by Jordan. So that these people who say that they're refugees are living in their own country. They're living in Palestine. They're supposedly citizens of Jordan. They are citizens of Jordan. But when it came to giving them a new life, and they became refugees, instead of absorbing them into the life of Jordan, free to move any place with jobs and opportunities and education and everything else, they were put down in the desert, 30 miles away from the capital. And there they have been, in, there they have been stuck all this period of time, forbidden to leave, unable to go, because the king of Jordan, their king, in a country of which they are citizens, fears them. And rightly so, because the Palestinians constitute a force which could overthrow the throne of Jordan, which rests just on the Bedouin. And so they've been maintained by the UN, and they're living in, these, in this desert camp, which is a wasteland, far from anything, unable to get, have access to whatever jobs they are, and so forth and so on. 
Now, supposing you have a situation where this comes up and they have a free choice, and the free choice is a gun at the back of their head and they're told to march in and say that they're freely choosing to go into Israel. The thing then becomes completely unmanageable. Well, I, we're up to a whole hour of talking, and just let me, uh, well, all right, but just let me say in a general kind of a way, as might be predicted, and Roger said this too, too, in the informal discussion, he said, what are you fellows getting so excited about? The Russians won't accept it, and the Egyptians won't accept it. So what are you excited about? And I must say that for my own part, I felt that Rogers was right, because if we had not made a hullabaloo about it and said an interesting proposal, let us examine it, let us see what the Arabs have to say, let us see what the Russians have to say, then we will reply, they would have killed it, and we'll have to say, well, you see. They have killed it, so what do we have to talk about? But however, it has seriously compromised the negotiation position, because the United States has now taken a position that it lines up with Russia with England, with France, against Israel, so that if they do come up with something united, the indication is that the United States will take whatever is going to come up and say, take it or leave it, and Israel will then say, we're not going to take it, and we are then in the next phase. I now say, just to sum it up, that the affair of the Sherberg gunboats, the affair of the radar installation, the, the affair at Rabat, have all contributed by the hilarity of the occasion to dissipate the seriousness of the American effort. The report was that Rogers was very abused by the gunboat es escapade. I could imagine he turned to his wife and said, just when I've tried to get these guys to be serious, they have to do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, it is 12 o'clock, but I'll be glad to answer questions. This lady. El Fata? The question is what I think about El Fata. Well, I really don't know what to think exactly, uh, except this, that uh, there's a lot of money which is being contributed to this organization. And there are many organizations like it. Everybody has his own commando group. The Syrians have a commando group against Israel. The Iraqis have a commando group against Israel. Nasser has a commando group against Israel. And the Fatah are a commando group against Israel, who assign to them the role of being revolutionaries who are going to overthrow everything in the Middle East, and they join up with the Third World people and all that. I can't take them too seriously as commandos for one reason. Commandos are people who engage in military operations against the enemy. Fatah does not engage in military operations against the enemy. They engage in atrocities against the civilian population of no discernible military value. And the quality of what they do is very low. They themselves don't come forth, but uh, generally in places like uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, where grenades are getting thrown, they're hiring people to do it, and people do it under threats. I think from a military point of view, they are completely ineffective. They cost a great deal of money to deal with. It's cost Israel a great deal of money to set up uh, the electro uh, electronic uh, devices and the fence along the Jordan to uh, diminish them. But they do not have an effect. They cost Israel a great deal. But from a military point of view, I think that what they're accomplishing is nothing. Uh, morally speaking, I think that it's a reprehensible group for this reason. Not that they're fighting, but they're supposed to be a truce. The countries have all agreed to a truce. And their attacks upon the civilian population are simply to keep themselves in being, really. I don't want to seem to diminish the notion that the Arab himself can't have strong nationalist feelings and have a feeling that he must struggle. I think that's another phase of the thing. I, I don't want to uh, deride it. I think it's the same strong feelings that Jews have, the Arabs have. But uh, the solution to all this, when there is a way open for a peaceful solution to engage in atrocities for the sake of atrocities, in order to keep your own force in being uh, for political purposes of your own, I think is uh, a reprehensible aspect of the whole thing. 
I mean, I'm not giving you a complete answer, but I don't know the internal workings of the Fatah. These are only surface things. Anybody else? This lady. Well, Israel uh, has uh, been doing many constructive things. And when I was there about two and a half months ago and went down to this refugee camp at Jericho, uh, they had determined to take the water which is being wasted there and try to set up a form of kibbutz for Arab volunteers, or Moshav, something, a settlement, so that Arab refugees who wish to can be settled on the land and own the land and have a productive life. Another thing Israel is able to do and has been doing is uh, to uh, use the Arab labor. There are about 30,000 Arabs who work in Israel. And there are many who work in industries in the West Bank which supply Israel, factories that are being set up. Israel spends about $30 million, according to the last budget I saw, on social services in the Arab population in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. And Israel also has part of its economic development budget is fostering the setting up of uh, economic development in the West Bank to improve employment. Israel does another very important thing and unique in the world by keeping the border open to Jordan so that the produce of farmers in the West Bank is freely sold in the Arab country and they go back and forth in spite of the terrorist attacks. They have a terrorist attack and trade still goes on. There's about $30 million of trade that goes on between the, between the countries. And then, uh, as other parts of the program, uh, Israel's agricultural development is brought to the West Bank, which has been increasing the income among those people. I think on the whole, uh, this may not specifically apply to people in the refugee camps, but for the first time, they're free to move out of the refugee camps and free to take employment, and they do. There are other whole series of operations. The policy that Diane, who in the, is responsible for this because it's part of the military operation, has been to make the Arab realize that although he's not expected to be a friend of Israel, that's not thought of, that Israel is the government of this whole territory, and that because it's the government of the whole territory, it takes the responsibility for the well-being of the people within the territory, and that the Arab is not to be uh, changed, he's not to be uh, injured, he's not to be mortified, he's to be treated with full dignity, with the only restriction upon it being the question of security. I think P, the Arab himself understands it, and that's why I think that this expression of admiration for Diane uh, comes from the Arabs, because he is hewing to the line, it's not deceptive, it's not false talk, it's straight talk, and the Arab knows just exactly where he stands. Now, of course, terrorist acts take place because within the Arab population, there are terrorist groups. But that was true in Ireland, that's true in Northern Ireland, that's true uh, in many parts of the world where within the population, groups are undertaking these acts, and it's very difficult. Um, I think that if the Arab refugee has any chance at all, it is through Israel. But if you want my, the larger program that would be, was that in the underpopulated Middle East, in countries which had vast populations in ancient days, when the irrigation systems were unsilted and when the civilization uh, flourished, there is more than enough room for them all. And if there were peace, the purchasing power and the commercial activity of Israel would so enhance the economic growth of Jordan alone that all the refugees who are now living in camps, and many of them are not living in camps, there's a lot of myth to that too. 50,000 at least are working in the oil fields, supporting people in the camps or living in the camps be in Jordan because they are fearful that if they lived in Israel, they not, not, might not get the remittances from the uh, workers in the oil field. The real solution would be along those lines that the increased well-being of the whole area would enable all the refugees to live productive lives and to be free men. But it is the cruelty of the Arab to the Arab, not the cruelty of the Jew to the Arab, that keeps them as refugees. This lady. Uh, is anything being done by the Jewish community throughout the United States to counter the violence against Jewish people? Because I know that, uh, Well, there is... Uh, 
a whole series of efforts that get made. Uh, how effective? I'm not in a position to say because I'm not involved in that phase of things and I'd have to ask somebody. But all the Jewish organizations are aware of it. There is a conference of mayor presidents of major Jewish organizations that meet and that take on united action and instruct their constituent bodies. There is the national uh, the NCRAC, it's a national conference of relations uh, that consists of the American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Congress, and many other bodies, and many local bodies coordinate together the dealing with anti-Semitic situations in general. And because this really is anti-Semitism, not just anti-Israelism and not anti-Zionism, these bodies, B'nai B'rith, Hadassah, uh, all the Zionist bodies, and all the other bodies as well, in all the big cities certainly have councils that deal with it. On the campuses, the youth division of the American uh, Zionist Council tries now to have resident people who deal with Arab students who are very active. There is a group of professors who deal on the campus with these kind of problems. I would hope that the Hillel do it too, but I don't think they're really geared for propagandists, uh, countering propaganda. And this is what the effort is. I don't think it's adequate, but it is what is being done. This gentleman. Has there been any change in attitude on the part of the United States towards uh, Israel's need for ammunition uh, since the Roger investigation? I don't know that the, that's so recent that I just don't know. I think that the United States is playing a uh, cat and mouse game here. Uh, they say that don't worry about things, we're not going to let you down, but let, we're studying. And I think that's pressure. But the other side of the coin is that Israel has become very self-sufficient in many areas. They don't need ammunition anymore. Israel makes and exports ammunition. Israel probably now is making her own airplanes. I don't say jet fighters, but making airplanes. They're certainly making tanks, and they have an arms export capacity. I haven't even gone into that, but Israel, as the days pass, grows larger and stronger and has greater capacity to fight the war on a more self-sufficient basis. I think she can build her own gunboats now if she wanted to, if it paid. <laughs> Any more? Well, thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.